I am very conscious, more so with every passing year, that everybody has one of these in their pockets. And, and this is a little distraction machine, you know? It's ringing, it's buzzing, it has all these different um, demands on people's attention. I'm very keenly aware that if I write something on a subject, even if the subject is important, nobody has to read what I write. It's not assigned, it's nobody's job. I shouldn't assume that people will read. I need to fight for their attention. And I think that the way to get their attention and to hold it is to tell a good story. I think, I think narrative is a, a really powerful delivery device for information. And so, yes, I'm interested in moral questions, philosophical questions, legal questions, right and wrong, um, big issues. But I want to package whatever exploration I do of those subjects in, in a narrative that will hopefully engage people. I think particularly when telling true stories that feel like they are stories about issues that seem important to me, um, it's much more challenging in some ways to, to get people's attention and hold people's attention because they're more distracted. So it's, it's not that the storytelling itself is new. There's nothing new about telling a good story, but it's that uh, in some ways I think y you sort of need to be as persuasive as possible in, I always think of myself as I want to, I want to reach out the pages and just grab you and, and hold on to you and not let go. I think of myself as working in the genre of narrative nonfiction. So hopefully it really reads like a story the way a good novel would. And you're turning the pages and you're absorbed and there's scenes and there's characters and there's themes and mood. And you feel like you're kind of born through the story. And that genre was born really with a book called In Cold Blood by Truman Capote, which started in The New Yorker actually as a series. And years after Capote published that book, it emerged that there are many things in that book that are made up. So he called it a nonfiction novel in a very self-congratulatory way. And he said, I'm inventing this new genre. But the truth was, it was really more like a regular old novel in the sense that there were a series of things in that book that he invented. And to me, he broke the, the most central rule of the business, which is that you can't do that. You can't create scenes. You can't invent dialogue. I need to, for the people who want to check my work, I need to make it clear that if the scene feels very alive and vibrant to you, it feels as though I've imagined it. And you don't trust that for one reason or another. You can go to the back of the book and you can see where my sources are. I think of myself as working in a, in a tradition of journalism that is trying to often, often not always, but often trying to hold the powerful to account. I think that's one of the jobs of journalism is to be skeptical of power, be skeptical of privilege, even one's own privilege, you know, and I'm, I'm the first to acknowledge the many privileges that I enjoy. Um, and so I think that's one of the jobs of journalism, not the only job, but one of the jobs. Um, I don't think of myself as an activist. I think of activism as somewhat different, but certainly the journalism that I do has a point of view. And um, if I'm writing about the Sackler family, for instance, my sole reason for writing about them is not that I, I want to achieve something, but to the degree that the writing ends up changing the situation somewhat for the Sackler family. I think of that as, as uh, I feel as though that's a, you know, personally, I feel like that's a kind of a sign of success that it's, that it has actually accomplished something. You know, when I write about um, any given issue, part of what I'm doing is expressing my own sense of discomfort or upset or alarm about broader 
trends that are emerging in our society. Usually I'm telling some very specific story, but a lot of the time I am expressing in one way or another, um, you know, my, my, my feelings about where things are going more broadly. So the book about the Sacklers is in part a book about impunity for the very elite, for the very wealthy, for the very powerful. And it's a very specific story about one family, but more broadly, that is a prevailing trend uh, here in Europe as much as it is in my country and one that I wanna tackle. I take the view that, that even the worst person in the world, a terrible criminal, a killer, you know, a drug lord, Chapo Guzman, is someone that I have something in common with. I think that it's often the case, particularly in journalism and in commentary, that people say, oh, that's an evil person. I don't relate to that person at all. I have nothing in common with this person. And I think there's a sort of moral vanity in that is that these people are like us and maybe they make different choices than we do. But the question is, how do they get from where we are to where they are? So when I wrote a, a book about the IRA, the sympathetic characters at the heart of that story are people who do terrible things. You know, they, they plant bombs in public places and kill people. Um, they kill civilians. And the question for me was, how do they get there? What is it that brought them to do that? I don't want to give you an off ramp, an emotional off ramp. You know, so it's, we're driving together, I'm telling you this story. I don't want you to be able to say, ah, I'm gonna get off here because I don't relate to that person. To me, much better to have you be trapped in the car, going all the way to whatever the final destination is and realize in, in ways that may be uncomfortable that you actually have something in common with some of these people. There has to be something more. There has to be some bigger issue at stake. And sometimes it's a very subtle, issue. Um, I, I wrote a story uh, about 10 years ago about a woman who was a mass shooter, a woman named Amy Bishop, and she was a professor as, at the University of Alabama. She shot six of her colleagues. And when my editor first said, oh, do you want to write about her? I said, no, I have no interest in writing about a mass shooter. I don't think it will add anything I don't, it's not enough for me. Unfortunately, in the United States, we have mass shootings all the time. And for me to describe a mass shooting wasn't interesting. But then he told me that this woman, Amy Bishop, when she was young, uh, she had shot and killed her brother with a shotgun in the kitchen of the family home. And there was only one witness to this killing. It was their mother. So the mother had only two children in the world and she walked into the house and she saw her daughter shoot her son and the police were coming. And when the police got to the house, the mother said, I saw the whole thing. It was an accident. And that to me seemed really interesting because what happened is this woman, Amy Bishop, she wasn't arrested. She wasn't questioned. She was never tried. She was never investigated. She never got any therapy. She just moved through her life and she went on and she became years later a professor at the University of Alabama. And one day she snapped and shot six of her colleagues. That decision that her mother made and the kind of denial where the mother made a decision that she was going to basically cover up what happened because she loved her daughter. She just lost her son. She didn't want to lose her daughter as well. And then the police came and this was in a small town and the police knew the family. And what the police officer said was, that family suffered enough. The story of a mass shooter, eh, it's not for me. A story where you can look at this kind of subtle tendency we have as humans in a community or in a family to know that something bad is happening, but avert our eyes. That to me is a kind of important subject, one that is very broadly applicable. You know, I've got, I've got I hope, another three decades of doing this kind of work, but I wanna reach people and if there comes a time when the way to do it is not with articles or books, then hopefully I'll find other ways to do that. Maybe it's podcasts, maybe it's documentaries. Um, you know, I don't know that I, the tricky thing for me is it's hard for me to work in short increments. <laughs> uh, I like complicated subjects. I usually have a lot to say.
So something like TikTok is very hard for me because, and my, I have children, I have an 11 year old and a 14 year old, and for them, they've grown up in the, you know, for them, if, if you can't do it in a minute, you're going on too long. And that's a scary thought for me because the truth is that life is complicated, you know, and sometimes it takes some time to explain a complex issue. Instagram story, TikTok, YouTube video, your whole narrative is compressed down to 30 seconds or 90 seconds. Um, all of that is true. And yet I also think that when I go out and, and, and do readings, and this is in countries all over the place, I mean, you know, throughout the United States and elsewhere, there are people who buy a physical book, young people, and spend 15, 16, 17 hours reading that book. And then they come out and they wanna be in a room and talk about it. And I think that there may be a little bit of a correction where, you know, for the last 15, 20 years, we've all had these devices in our pockets and, you know, we've, they've kind of driven us to distraction. I do think that something's happened to our concentration. And I think that um, to me, there is no, there's nothing to rival the satisfaction of a book or of watching a film that's actually two hours long. I think that it's impossible in any piece of writing to reproduce the truth in the way that you could in a, in a kind of unbroken cinema verite. Um, but I think you can get pretty close. And I think that it's our job to try and get as close as possible.